So, uh, Michael, you don't have to start recording now, but when I when I go to the speakers, if, well, you, you, I guess you can start whenever you like. Okay, sure. No problem. Thank you. Don't worry, I will edit it as well. So it's just yeah, great. Edit it. me out. That's the most important thing. Uh, right. Okay. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the first talk JS of the year of 2021. Um, yeah. Okay, here's our timeline. We've had a little bit of a chat. Um, I'm going to talk to you for a while, not too long, and then we're going to have the talks. Then at the end, we'll have an open mic and we can all have another chat. Uh, we have a code of conduct to try and make the meetup very uh, welcoming and a nice place for people. Um, you can find it uh, on our GitHub. Um, but the basics is just be respectful to each other. And if you have any, uh, if you have any concerns, if you have any problems, you're welcome to talk to any of the organisers in confidence. Um, I. I don't have a lot of JavaScript news. There's probably been some interesting things happening, but I haven't really uh, followed them. So the only thing I want to share is that there's this extension, the Great Suspender. And if you use it, you might want to have a look at what's going on there. But basically, it has a new owner. And he added in some, uh, some dodgy code and then took it out again. But none of it was on GitHub. It was just on the Chrome store. So um, yeah, you might want to take a look at that. And there's a there's a couple of alternatives. Uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about this, some of the local community things. If you don't know them, you probably do. But if there's any newcomers here, uh, so you should know about engineers.sg. Hmm. They have. Oh dear. Oh yeah, it's up there, right. Uh, okay, let's go to conduct. Engineers.sg has this website where they record all the meetups or as many as they can. Um, like they're recording this one t this evening. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, and they upload the videos. So if you've missed any of the meetups, you can hopefully catch up with them here. If you are a speaker, then you will be featured on here. Uh, and then you can share your video with the world. They also have a very nice events aggregator, which may, I think is pulling from meetup.com. And it tells you all the events coming up in the near future. You can even import it into your phone. I'm not sure if that's still working. Uh, here we are, here's our, here's our talk today. Okay, so that's engineers.sg. And if you want to help them, they're looking for volunteers. Um, I'm sure they would welcome you and they'd love to train you up. So this meetup is done by the Singapore JS group. We have a telegram channel, which uh, we would like to invite you to join. Um, if you're looking for a job, there is this useful telegram channel. But it's a funny URLs, so I will share it in the chat. Uh, that's uh, okay. And we have a bunch of links on this page. If you would like to give a talk at one of our future meetups, you can just pop over to our GitHub repository. So uh, the organization is Singapore JS, the repository is Talk.js. And over there we have. Uh, issues under issues we have an issue for each month so this is this is our current meetup uh, but you can if you want to submit a talk you can uh, you can comment on on this issue for February um, we're also looking for a volunteer a little bit casually but if anybody wants uh, if you want to help us out you can uh, Eric had some ideas about what to improve with the repository, that's, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, some local meetups you might want to know about. Junior Dev 
SG is for juniors and newbies in the tech industry. Uh, pretty good. Uh, React.js, not sure. That they haven't got anything coming up, but they might do. Uh, Google does a meetup as well. They have something coming up on at the start of February, but we don't know what yet. Oh, and we have a new meetup in town, um, a workshop. I went to it was a couple of weekends ago. I went to the first one, and Michael gave us a great uh, introduction to GraphQL, and um, we got to do it ourselves. So he sort of was presenting to us, and then we were copying what he was doing and um, making our own little GraphQL server and GraphQL client in on this web app. Anyway, that was great. And um, if you're interested in this meetup, you can follow the organizer, Julia Tong, on Eventbrite, not on meetup.com. And the next event is going to be on Elm, which is a functional programming language, but in the JavaScript ecosystem, runs in the browser. And that meeting will uh, show you the basic syntax of Elm, but it will also, I, th I think you'll get to code some and uh, perhaps see or perhaps make some demos uh, with, some, with some graphics or some data visualization. Should be fun, right? OK. Uh, I can hand over to the speakers in a moment, but I'll just say if you, if while the speaker's talking, you think of a question, you can either drop it in straight in the chat. Um, you can leave a little message in the Zoom chat, or you can scribble it down and wait till the end when we have the Q&A. Um, yeah, let's see if your question hasn't has or hasn't been answered. Because I always forget if I think of a question, I always forget. So I have to scribble them down. Okay, that's enough from me, thank goodness. So we're gonna go over to Trung Vo. He's gonna talk about uh, building Tetris in Angular 10. And then later on we're going to for Li Hao Tan is gonna talk about Svelte. Okay, I will stop sharing and I will give it to you, Trung. Sure. Uh, thanks, uh, Joe, for the introduction. Let me share my screen quickly. I should. Uh, let me know when you guys all can see the screen because. Uh, yeah. I think. Uh, e just a sec. I think it is too small. I wanted to do it a bit <clears throat> like bigger. So there's the phone screen option. Okay. I think it's better now. Yeah. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Chung. I'm a front end engineer in, in Singapore, and uh, today I'll talk about a small Tetris game that I built with Angular, like maybe six months ago during the circuit breaker. I mean, not not circuit breaker. It's just the time I spent. I stayed at home, and <laughs> I think it was a cool thing to do. Um, so before we hey, just like, can I hide this one? Uh, hi. Floating? Okay. Okay, thanks. Uh, so uh, just a bit about me before we, we continue. So I'm uh, currently a front-end engineer at Cake Defy, a platform that lets you earn uh, cash flow through your cryptocurrency. And we also are like, looking for a JavaScript engineer at the moment. So you are interested in, and uh, just take a look at our Twitter. Also, I'm an organizer of Angular Vietnam. and um, uh, we has the uh, Twitter also at the moment, NGVN official. You can follow us to get a uh, less Disney about Angular and uh, our upcoming event. One of the uh, focusing we are doing is like the 100 day of Angular that we wrote in Vietnamese to try to um, advocate the Angular community in Vietnam. And so for today agenda, I will uh, go through Tetris and why I build the Tetris game with Angular. What is the tech stack behind? And there's some uh, development challenge that I, I faced uh, when I was working with the game itself. So yeah, like I started. <clears throat> so the uh, Tetris game, like I hope that all of us are famil familiar with it. It's like a game that invented by Alexei, a Russian, in 1984. So the, the rule is very simple. You just rotating and move the, the pieces so that 
you try to fill out the horizontal row like of the block thing without any empty cell. You, you can fill in like a solid row, which means that you can clear that and you got the score. And that, yeah, basically that Tetris and uh, the version that I be with Angular is look like that. You can go to tetris.chungk18.com and let me slide here. Yeah. So that is again, basically it follow the same rule of Tetris. You can take the pieces, it generate the pieces for you. You can move it out and yeah, try to fill in the block, maybe something like that. Yeah, so when this one uh, row is filled with all of the uh, block, it will just clear it. So yeah, basically that is a game. It uh, has some option. You can uh, turn, off, uh, turn off and turn on the sound and you yeah, can put the pieces like faster by pressing the space like that. And yeah, that is uh, the angle of Tetris that I built. <laughs> oh, sorry. Hey. So why I decided to build Angular Tetris is like, I think Tetris was one of the, the first game console that I ever had in my life, like when I was like five years old. And at that time, the the money, like the Tetris game cost about like a 2,000 of egg. We can feed the family for about one or two weeks. So I think when my dad gave me the Tetris, he really like uh, hoped that I utilize the game and really enjoy it. And actually I will really enjoy it. I, the one that I have is like the yellow thing here. I think, yeah, it's still the, now they, they still selling it, but uh, the quality is not like the one that I have before. Maybe, I don't know, just the feeling different. And um, the angular textures that were not like origin or originated coming from my, my mind. It's like, I saw the similar version, which is written in VHS. And also my wife saw it and uh, I thought that why not I do the same with Angular. And also my wife encouraged me to do the same thing. So, you know, that, that is the thing in life. You have to accept it. <laughs> and uh, I think that was the time when I, I received the, the Tetris. So it's like 1996 or 97. I was born in the, in the uh, rural area. It's like the mountainside of Vietnam. So at the background, you can see that just a mountain and uh, the house was like um, really 20 years ago, I guess. Yeah, so because there's a view of Tetris already, so the, the approach was, I think it's, it's much simple for me. I don't have to design the game. I don't have to write all of this HTML CSS. So the, the thing I did first is like, I look at the VHS source code and I build a, a small to-do list because I work like, by my own, but I still need something to like keep track of the task. So it is just the, the simple to-do list. Oh uh, yeah. yeah, okay, I have it here. Yeah, so basically it is gonna look like that, very simple. It just has some uh, checklists and I'll uh, just keep track of what I'm, I'm going to do. Chung, we, we cannot see, I think we can only see your slides at the moment. If oh, you yeah? switch to another app, we cannot oh. see. If you really want to do that, then you might have to unshare and reshare. I see, just a sec. Maybe I just do it in the same screen like that? Yeah. Yeah, okay, sure. Just uh, give me a sec, I will bring back the, the thing here. Oh, no, uh, okay, have a try. But I think we're still looking at your browser. I think when you shared your screen, you only shared your browser. E oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I think I, think, I, think, yeah, I think I get what you mean. So just now there's a few things that you I didn't see. Uh, yeah, uh, I think you were playing the game maybe. Yeah, yeah, but uh, it's fine, I think. So can you see it now? Sorry, just want to check. Can you still see the slide? Oh, you no, don't I see can only see you now. Okay. Uh, if you go share screen and then desktop, the I think. Desktop? But it's just the desktop one. Maybe I try it. Can you see it now? I can see your browser still. Yeah, you can see the slide. Yeah, correct. Sure. Yeah, okay, so the, the game is basically look like that. Just now I, I show it, but uh, I think you I didn't see it, so. Right, yeah. Yeah. Just hide this one. 
So this is a game. Basically, you can go into the address here, tetris.truncatin, you can play it around. And basically, it's just very simple. You can use keyboard to navigate the thing around. And uh, yeah, basically, it's just trying to clear, like fill in the pieces. And it's going to be clear for you. And you can enable sound. I think it's going to be loud. Yeah, Not sure you can hear it, but you play it on your own browser, it's going to be a bit louder. So yeah, so I just talking about this uh, simple checklist for myself to keep track of all the tasks that I'm, I'm working on. It is not to like uh, a proper Kanban board or something. It's just something for me to know where I am and when it's gonna be ready for publishing. And uh, I'll just started with the HTML that that you are seeing here. So the HTML is like just the skeleton with the with the Game Boys and stuff. And the, the core thing is just the, the one in the central of the screen where everything is moving and you can use a keyboard or smile to control it. And I'll uh, end up using a, a, another library for, for the core of the game because writing the whole thing like from scratch is not something that I like to do. And it's gonna take a lot of time. And um, I also uh, replace the set timeout and set interval uses with the IHS, which is the reactive like way of, of um, doing program. And it's just like uh, well known in the Angular community. And yeah, after that, I'm just handling the keyboard and the sound thing. So when I look at the VOHS code, it was, I think it was well written. It is just like, because it was written in JavaScript, so there's a few parts that it could be like easy error prone because when you, you build it, it didn't tell you like which part might go wrong. It is like, it's a nature of JavaScript, which is a dynamic language. So we cannot blame it. But when I start to migrate the code over to TypeScript, I start to realize there's a few bugs that we can catch earlier. And uh, the, the viewer version was using set timeout and set interval like a lot of time and there's, there were a few parts that was difficult to understand and I will show you guys now, I think. So this is the, like I said, is the most important part of the game and because the screen is a bit smaller. So the left side is basically what I was like, rewrote with TypeScript. It is just the surface and the right side was the viewer chairs. So I try to break it into a smaller function and give it a like, um, like meaningful name so that when you read a code after six months, you can understand it a bit. Um, the viewer, I think there's there's a few bit that I don't understand, like all of these four thing and just that all of the manipulation plus thing here, like X, Y at the zero at one. And I don't really understand it. So that's why I, I decided to use another library and also um, re rewrite the, the brain of the game. I don't reuse the uh, VOHS um, logic for that. So I, I use this NGX Tetris game. So it is just a call. Like basically there's an array which fill in like uh, 200 uh, object. And when you wanted to render it on the UI, you need to do your own path. It just provided you the call, which is the data structure. And um, I added a bit more functionality like navigating between the pieces like left, right, and uh, clearing and, and stuff. But the, the core thing was like still inside the, the library, ng Tetris. Uh, give the guy a shower. He's very did a good job here. So the game loop, when you think about it, it's very simple. You see it like, uh, when you start the game, always there's uh, every time, like after a, a fixed like time, there will be the pieces going down and when it's reached to the bottom, another pieces will be like like uh, like will be rendered on the screen, and it's keep going down, and it just keep going down. And for every movement, you will try to check when the thing is like colliding with other pieces. You wanted to know, is it like filling one solid row so that you can clear it, or it is the game over state? That's it. Very simple. So the it is just inside in one simple function called auto 
and it takes a delay, which is the number in millisecond. And I'll just run the timer. Every this delay like could be 300 millisecond. The the speed is gonna be faster along the way when you like like uh, getting like higher score. So the level here now is one, but it could go up to six. When the level is going up, it means the time for you to um, the time when the PC is falling is faster. Like I can start the level five, and you see the 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 PC is moving really fast. That is the delay that I put in. And if you look at the code, the the auto function is calling just one function, which is the update function. And just a sec. Uh, can you still see the code now, Joe? Joey? Yes, can see. Sure, thanks. So the the function to um to the the function inside the the game loop was pretty simple. That is the update function, and the update function is just do a few thing like I mentioned above. So it will. Oh, that there's a few parts I, I will not explain because uh, it's just the way I, I, I do it. So basically, you wanted to try to move the current pieces now, like just plus one on the screen. And then if it's colliding with the bottom, you you mark the current pieces as solid, which means that there's uh, even it has been filled on the screen. It's not going anywhere else. It's, it's fixed the position. And then you try to check if the thing is like making a full line or making the full two line or making the full uh, three or four line. And then after that, just trying to set the next pieces available. And then uh, if it is like get out of this function, it will draw the next pieces and then the update will call again and you will get the, the thing. So yeah, basically that's the roughly the idea. And you can uh, always take a look at my code. Okay. So go back to the slide. So now, uh, get back to the to the data structure that I store the, the pieces. So basically, the pieces that render on the screen is just the geometric shape that composing a four square. You can see that all of that is four square, and it's just in a different uh, arrangement. Like the S and the G here is like the reflection of each other, or the L and the J here is just the reflection of each other. And to store it, I has the base class, which I call pieces. And then at a certain point of time, there's always X and Y to know that Y is on the screen. And I has the shape thing, the shape property to store the current shape at the moment because the pieces could like rotate, like something like that. Yeah. So you need to know exactly the, the current shape of the pieces. Like if I change to this one, it's like, it has four direction uh, movement. So the shape is just like to store the, the current uh, shape of, of pieces at a certain point of time. And let me open the code for you so that you can see it easier. So that is the base class. Just X and Y and the, the current rotation. Always it will start with uh, degree zero, and uh, if you take a look in the rotation, you can see that there's um, just zero, ni uh, 90 degree, 180, and 270. So always like maximum four direction. And the shape, if you look into, there's a there's an array of shape, which is just an array of something else. If I look into the Z, or maybe the T thing. So I just set the, the shape of the T by default, which is an empty array, and then I put in the corresponding of the degree to the shape. So if you look into the the array here, so one is meaning it's gonna be rendered on the screen, and zero is like nothing. I put it like four four times four because the 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 I thing is gonna take the whole row and the whole thing. So I need to put it at least four by four. <laughs> That's the reason if I have the question. And um, if you define all of the movement, like degree, you can see that there's also the property called next, 
which to display it on the on the right side. Basically, that's the, the one. The next shape. So I, I, I'm not using the same because the next here is like going to be the smaller, like two times eight, uh, two times four. Yeah, it's just the, the array is smaller. So I, I don't use the, the same data structure that I put for the shape. But basically, that's the idea. And because I put the shape in this like very like verbose way, so that if you wanted to do a customized pieces, it's going to be simple. I would say so. Because I, I tried it before with a simple pieces, which is not existing on the Tetris game ever. Like this is the F thing. So you can put in the F and if you look at the code, it's going to be quite interesting to see because it's, it's going to be very simple. You just define the pieces F, which extend from the piece class. And then in the, the, the shape array, you put in what you want it's going to look. So if you put the degree like 90, you can just copy and paste it and you change the, the thing here. So it will like update corresponding on the UI for you. I think it's, it's quite easy to extend. And the piece is going to be generated through one factory. Actually, I forgot what's called. Is it like piece factory? Oh, yeah, it's a piece factory. So when I try to get a piece to display on the, the screen, it tries to generate a new bag, which always has a maximum of, uh, I think, seven uh, Tetris pieces. And it is to evenly distribute the piece, like you will see at least the, the, the Z or at least the T. If you, are, if you just do it like a, a, a random movement without put, putting into the bag, which means you could see the T like five times and then you see the 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 T, then it's gonna, not gonna make sense. So I put thing into the current bag and if the bag is empty, I will generate the new bag, which has all of the all of the pieces that I, I put in. So that I make sure that the pieces will be like evenly distributed. You might see this thing one, but you see the, the other thing twice, right? for example, it's the maximum. You will not see something 10 times and you see another piece for like just one time. Yeah, that, that is the idea behind this back thing. Yeah, and I think yeah, it's just basically about the data structure of the piece. And in short, it's, it's quite verbal, but it's easier to extend. So I think I will still stick with that approach in the future if I need to build something. I, I would rather yeah, doing it verbal and easier to understand and maintain rather than to do it a bit short and then later on we'll be struggling. <laughs> um, animation Y is, uh, I didn't like, I'm not an expert of keyframe and stuff. So I using IHS also to rewrote the animation. And on the viewer JS version, they was using set timeout and set interval a lot, which creating this callback that we all knew about. So I don't want to repeat that uh, uh, this season. So I just try to do it with the uh, IHS. So the animation wise, I was utilizing one of the uh, CLS transform thing to just flip the image over so that I don't have to store two image. And what does it mean is like when you put the scale width negative one, it will just flip the thing over. Like you put it thing into the mirror and that is how I do to get the reflection of the dinosaur when you see it, when you first open the app, this one, this dinosaur. So by default, I only has the uh, photo to store it facing to the right side. But when I do the transform with scale negative one, I has exactly the same version, but the dinosaur now is looking to the left side. And why do I need this? Because it's just to make some animation. Yeah, basically. So the first animation we need to look at is the eye. The eye is very simple. It's just like changing between the first two photos, the one and the two. If you look at, this is the first one and the, the second one. So it's just eye close and eyes open. And here is like eye close and eye open. I also do very simple eye chest. The timer here is working exactly like set interval. So it will go into this, this uh, tab like every 500 milliseconds. 
and I will check why the thing is less than six. And if it's even, I will just uh, set it to one. If not, it's, it's set it to two. So basically, it's just to uh, toggle between the two states every 500 milliseconds so that you have this animation, which is the dragon is uh, opening the eye. The next thing is like the running animation, which is you still do the same, but because the running is requiring faster movement, that's why I put the timer, it's just 100 milliseconds. And every, like after the, the leg is moving for eight of, or 10 times, it will change the direction. So inside the tap function, I also check whenever it's, uh, it's moved like enough for every like um, it's uh, divided by 10, which is it's moved for 10 movement on one side. Then I just flip the side by doing this left and right. So the left and right here is using the, the transform negative one that you saw before. That's why I can flip between the two sides. And then the same thing. It will just toggle between the three and the four uh, sprite. If you see it, it's just the three and the four. So just the leg is moving up and down. And if you just toggle it fast, it will look like it is moving. That's it. Very, I think it's going to be simple. And at the end, I need to combine the thing together. And by combine the thing, I mean the dragon will open the eye and then it will start to run. Run, 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 please run. Yeah, and start to run. And then after a while, it will open the guy and just keep repeating this thing. So I was combining the two things together using this uh, concat operator, which means that you just finish the first one and then you run the second one. I put the delay for five seconds because when I first load the tetris, usually it's going to take five seconds for the first animation, which is this one, the one go down and go up. And then I start to load the uh, dinosaur. And after it's finished one time, it's going to stop yeah, for another five seconds. And it will restart it again. Trung, so, uh, could, could you wrap up in about five minutes? Is that OK? Sure, yeah, yeah. I think it should, should be OK. OK. Yeah, probably fine. And yeah, it is, at the end, it's the animation on the left is that what I did, and the right is the, the original version. Basically, it's not very identical, but yeah, for me, it's good enough. <laughs> so the keyboard handling was simple because in Angular, they has this hot listener. So you just define the function. You put the hot listener and you put, uh, you put the key with the, like you separated it with the dot and then like you do key down and the arrow left. So when you press the left on the keyboard, it will go inside this function, like automatically. And what you need to do is just to handling it. And for the web audio is a bit uh, tricky because different browser get a uh, different implementation for the web audio. So that I receive a lot of uh, feedback after I publish it on, on GitHub. And the guy was saying that sound were not like working properly. That's why I'm using this audio context monkey patch. You might want to yeah, consider to use it. So basically it's just like uh, streamline uh, some of the API between uh, Chrome, Opera, Firefox and stuff. And you don't have to worry about the rest. Yeah, and I think it's somewhere here. Should be, I forgot. And with that, yeah, the time spending was like, I was spent about 30 hours. I think it was still a bit long because I don't have to write all of the HTML and CLS and also the core of the game. But still, it took 30 hours, which is like a week of work. But yeah, pretty enjoying it. Like, it's a cool game anyways, and I can play it later on. Uh, got some community support and uh, people were sharing it over and over and I was really like exciting to see it. It's growing. Yeah, it will even get to the top training on GitHub for like one day for Thai trip. And with that, thank you. And uh, I hope you uh, enjoy playing the game. Uh, yeah, I think that's it from my talk. And if you have any questions, just 
just uh, yeah, just put it on the chat or you can unmute and we can uh, have some discussion now. Thank you. And uh forgot, happy new year, everyone. I'm finished. Thank you very much, Chung. Thanks, and uh, I'll just take a screenshot. <laughs> I did have a couple of questions, but wow. then you answered both of them. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Does anyone else have a question? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I know because I always talk about Angular, but I think because I did it for a long time, so that is the only thing that I very understand. I just started with React recently, and I think React was, yeah, I, I was not to the level that I can talk about something. <laughs> but uh, I think Li Hao, uh, he is very like interesting on s how how to call it like stealth. I mean, I I, I cannot I cannot uh, pronounce it. Still? Svelte. Svelte, Svelte. I guess. I guess. So, yeah. Looking forward to the Svelte. Okay, no questions. I will have a little look at the code later because Angular is, or the, it was, actually it was the React RxJS was, uh, it's a little bit alien to me, but uh, I can oh, yeah. see what's going on, but it's it's quite a different way to do things, isn't it? Yeah, I think usually when I also, when I started with Angular, I didn't really understand what is going on with RHS, but once you, you get into it, yeah, you start to realize there's, there's few use case you can implement differently with RHS. It's just the indirect way of uh, putting things because Usually we click a button and then you perform like con an, a method on the class. But with IHS, like you click a, an, a button and the button will fire an event. And somewhere on the code, there's there's an event listener who listen to this click thing. And what you need to do, you, you need to base on the stream of event that's coming in and you handle it, it differently. So yeah, it's just a different way to think about a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, thanks for having me, and yeah, I hope you enjoy. I did. So uh, let's go on to Li Hao Tan. He's going to talk about Svelte Actions. Oh, uh, yeah. Find a way to unshare the screen. <laughs> oh, it, if you, it might be at the top if it's. Uh, okay, yeah, I'm yeah. sure you'll find it. Yeah, uh, but sorry. Yeah, I did. Great. Okay. Oh. Okay, can everyone see my screen right now? I can see it. Okay, cool. Um, let me take a sip. Okay, so hello everyone, welcome. Um, nice to meet you all. Although I can't, uh, I'm staring at my screen right now, which is just my slides. <laughs> but uh, welcome everyone, and uh, it's it's very nice to be here. And um, yeah, <laughs> so today I'll be talking about um, introduction to Svelte actions. Um, so it's a feature of Svelte. Uh, it's like a, yeah, it's called the spell actions. And I, before we dive into the topic itself, let me share a bit more like who am I? Well, so once again, um, my name is Li Hao. Uh, so I'm a software engineer at Shopee. And currently, um, I, I was like working on some open source projects and currently I'm like a, a commentator of spells. Uh, it's, it's just like um, making some fixes on Svelte and then, yeah, suddenly I become like commentator. But uh, recently I have more of my focus on uh, making content 
um, educational content about Svelte or JavaScript or front end stuff, right? So uh, I guess that's like how COVID changed us, where it's like thinking of like um, maybe trying out multiple stuff, different things. And one of the things that I'm trying is like making YouTube videos and having fun doing it. Well, if you want to support me, probably subscribe to my channel, you know, uh, maybe, or maybe propose any interesting things that you want to see me building and probably I will just make them, right? Because I was not really sure what other things that I can make. Uh, so still discovering. So uh, first of all, uh, what is Svelte? Um, yeah, so it's, it's like, I would say like it's another front-end framework. Um, like React or Angular, if you're familiar with them, or Vue.js, right? Svelte is, I guess you can categorize it as like a front-end framework in, in those category, right? Um, and it's a little bit different from um, React and Vue and Angular uh, in a sense that a bit, okay, it's, it's a bit different with React where most of the stuff that is happening it's happening during the build time where it compounds your code into uh, like plain JavaScript, right? So you write a code that looks like Svelte's code, which I'm going to show you later. And it will take that code and compile it to just JavaScript code that will get run on the browser. So most of the stuff like figuring out like uh, reactivity, figuring out stuff actually done during the compilation step. Whereas for Java, uh, for React, um, you probably write um, JSX, which is still just, which is just a sugar syntax for JavaScript, which uh, it's like building uh, like a view. Okay, I'm, I, I guess I'm, I'm very bad at describing this, but yeah, it's, it's uh, most of the heavy lifting of the reactivity for React happens on the runtime, which is while you're executing the code. Whereas figuring out all the stuff mostly happens in the build time for Svelte. Um, so this would be, so I guess just to like make you guys have a sense of like how Svelte looks like, this is a component written in React. You have a function called component. Uh, you have states by using a hooks like use states. And then you return like a div with two buttons and accounts. Right, uh, the same thing can be written with uh, Svelte like this, where as you can see here, it feels more like HTML, right? And you can declare states like this variable counts, just declare it like a variable as compared to here, you will have to call like a use states to get that state variable, where here you're just declaring a, you declare a variable and it will behave like a state. And for stylings, you can have a style tag, which, for example, in this case, you add padding to the div, and you will only apply it to the div that is written within this file, right? So it is kind of like having like inline style, but it's not. It's actually adding styles to uh, using selectors in a CSS, um, but it will only apply to the div that you are the div that's written within this file. <laughs> Then I guess slightly different would be say, for example, the uh, li uh, on-click listener, right? So now you use things like, it feels a bit like template where you have directives, which is like something, a colon and something, right? So you have like on colon click, which allows you to add like a click listener uh, versus like on-click as a property for that uh, attribute or property for your buttons. Right, and one thing you will notice different is that um, I, to update accounts, I use count plus plus. I can modify the variable directly. Um, somehow, when it compiles to JavaScript code, it handles that nicely and makes sure that the counts variable is reactive. Right, uh, whereas in, in React, you are calling a set count. Um, yeah, basically, besides this, it looks pretty much the same. It's just happenings different things happening under the hood, right? So uh, if I believe that I've been mentioning that there's like compilation stuff happening under the hood, um, if you feel that it feels foreign to you, you have no idea what I'm trying to say. Um, actually, I did 
a talk uh, about compiling scopes in your head in Tom's Yes, can't remember, a few months ago. So I'll probably find a link and or you can find that in Engineering SG as they recorded everything. Right? Um, oh, it's also on my YouTube channel, so you can find that there as well. Right? So let's go to like one of the features of Svelte, which is Svelte Actions, which is what I'm going to share with you all today. So Svelte Actions uh, is like an um, directives as well. So previously, we have a directive that looks like on and then colon and click, right? That allows you to do like event listener on that element. Right now you have a new one, which is use colon and then action. And then you can pass parameters within it, right? So in Svelte syntax, when you want to pass in like expressions, so prob probably you would wrap it with like curly brackets, right? So this is like, this params is passing into this action. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, synthetically, it, it, semantically it means like this. Uh, but what, what actually does it mean is that uh, you can define any fun you can define a function called action. So what it means is that action is actually a function. It's just a normal function. Um, so one thing you note notice here is that it has to be the same name, right? So uh, when you use action here, you are referring to a variable which is a function that is defined within your scope, right? It could be defining in your script tag over here, or it can be a global variable or anywhere you import from. As long as you import the name, the variable, of the, the name of the action matches with this, then you will use this function action, right? Uh, yeah, I haven't covered like how it used, but you will use this function as an action. And this function itself is um, like some sort of contractual between Svelte, is, uh, that there's like this function, it's just a normal function, but you can have two parameters which I'll be passing in to you. Right, I will pass you when you when this div is uh, mounted onto the screen. Right, uh, Svelte will call this function with the element, which is this div, the div that is just mounted, and params will be whatever the parameters like it's written over here uh, in your in your elements. Right, so which means that you can have multiple divs that use the same action but passing the different params, then this action function will be called multiple times with different elements and different parameters. And if this function itself returns an object, then another interesting thing will happen is that uh, whenever someone changes the params, for example, uh, change the value of the params, um, then the updates method in this object will be called with a new param so that you know that whenever something is changed over here, you get notified in your action function. And yeah, and then you can also provide a method called destroy in that object that you return. And that will be called when your diff, that element is being removed from the screen, right? So the, the main idea of this file action is like this, right? So summarize a bit, uh, it's like you can write a function which is which taking two parameter element and a param, and this function will be called every time when you have an element that use this action is mounted, and then uh, when the param changes, your update method will be called, and if someone removes this div, for example, maybe due to if else uh, like some condition you remove it or the whole component is being removed, then the destroy method will be called, right? So. Uh, what can we do with actions? So one simple example over here uh, is you can use it to integrate a UI library. Um, so I'm gonna now go step into a Svelte REPL, which we can, um, which I'll do some like coding, like coding kind of thing where I can show you what, how it works, right? So um, all of this example, I'm gonna show you now uh, and later will uh, all actually, I've actually done that, uh, did them uh, on my YouTube channel. If I'm not that clear, you can always watch them on my YouTube channel, right? Sorry with the plug, but let's go on. Right, so we have um, over here, I choose like this library, uh, no reason, no particular reason. It's just that it says that it is 
uh, dead picker that is lightweight and powerful and it has no dependencies, right? So that's why I'm just like, can we integrate this with Svelte? Um, so probably you would need to import like flat picker and then do it, right? So uh, I'm going to come here over here and uh, I'm going to have a, bu a button says date. The picker, right? So what you do over here is that if you want to, in, uh, if you read through, I, I've read through these docs, but if you skip, skim it through, what happens is that if you want to create a date picker out of your any elements, you just call a flat picker API from flat picker, and then you call it with that element, right? So this is um, usually how like a library without, uh, that is not tied to any like React or Angular would look like most of the case. Because if you are using React or Angular or Vue, then they will tell you that this is a component and use your component, right? But if you are like a just vanilla JavaScript, then probably you'll say that if you want to make some elements like a date picker, then you'll pass in that element. Right? So I'm gonna copy, paste this in, import flat picker. And I need to call flat picker function with the element, which is this button, right? Uh, with like the button element. Oops. Let me zoom it up a bit, right? So one way I can do it is that I can use actions because this is what I'm gonna share today. So I can have an action. I'm gonna just call any name I want, date picker, maybe. And it takes, so it's a function that takes in an element and a param, right? So to use this action, I'll just call use and then the same name, just make sure the name is the same. And I can choose to pass in parameters or not, right? If I'm not, then this param should be called with undefined. Uh, then I will call flat picker over here. Uh, so this is the element that I have the flat picker. Um, then you will see that something happens. Uh, this button has become a date picker, except that um, the style is not there, right? So one thing I can quickly do is that um, according to this, I need to import this um, at the styles for flat picker. So I'm gonna paste this into the, over here, right? The style is in and yeah, you, integrate with a library like that, right? So it's pretty easy, right? Pretty straightforward, I would say. Uh, and if you look closely over here, right? Uh, one thing that, uh, flat picker instance, one thing that probably would need to take notes of is that um, it says that there's like a destroy method over here in this library, meaning it will clean up like event listeners and stuff, which means that you, also should do that, right? So let me like uh, time picker instance. Instance, I need to return a destroy method and I need to remember to call destroy, right? So when, so this will be called, uh, this, this destroy function will be called when your elements, when your button is being removed. For example, if you have like if this component is being unmounted or maybe you have conditions like if uh, show or something, right? Uh, let's show equals true. If you have like something like this and show suddenly becomes false, this button is removed, then you need to clean up uh, all the event listeners for this flat picker, right? So uh, so that's, that's why you need to add this destroy methods in your flat over here, right? And then probably let's take a look at some um, things. For example, our change, I can see what, what can we do, current month. Okay, so for example, if you change uh, set date. Okay, so for example, maybe you can do something like uh, open and close over here shows open and close of the calendar. Uh, you call the open or close method, right? So that is something that we can do over here. Like say for example, open, true. And then maybe we can pass that open or close in this as a parameter. 
uh, which means that if someone changes this variable, we would want to get notified. And the way we do it is we have a new params over here. Uh, and what we do here is that um, new param would actually will be the value of open. So if we know that it is like open, then we call an instance dot open. And if we know that it is false, then probably we just say instance dot close over here. Right, so you can basically do a lot of different kind of things, depends on like what you want to design as a parameters for your action. Um, so here, I gonna have, uh, I'm gonna have like a checkbox. Uh, bind check equals to open. Um, right, so if I uncheck, check, it will open and uncheck, this variable will change to false and then we'll close it, right? So that is it, um, integrating, like you can use actions to integrate with other libraries. Right, so I have other examples. Uh, probably I may not have time to cover all of them, but I, I basically included links and the videos if you're interested, but I believe that they are just different um, use cases of actions, uh, but using it is pretty much straightforward as we can see over here. So let's take a look at one more example, which is like reusing event listeners, right? What I mean reusing over here is that um, if you take a look at this, so I have multiple examples, but I'm gonna just take a look at a third example over here, which is this one. Um, you can write, say, you can have an input and then you have a key down event listener where you listen to on key down. And as you type something, uh, you probably record the keys and then, you know, uh, if the keys matches with this combo, uh, then you will say unlocked, you will, you, will, you will set, like you will set a variable unlocked to be true, something like that, right? So in this case, it's called, a, uh, let me, let me think it's up, down, up, down, left, right, left, right. And then the secret will unlocked, right? So you can use event listeners to do this, then basically, then probably you will have to define this uh, event listeners different multiple times, uh, maybe with a different unlock or maybe with a different secret or something like that. Um, so one way you can try to reuse this event listener is um, to have something like this, where you can use an action, uh, any name I can call. So I'm just calling secret combo action over here. And you can pass in like the secrets and the callbacks function, right? And you can change the secret value. Then basically this will be updated. The, uh, the, the, the action will be updated and know that uh, what is the new secret. And you can pass in a dynamic callback function, right? So here uh, unlocked is true. This is, okay, this can be something else be true. And you can also uh, pass in different kind of secret, right? And this way, Basically, you encapsulate like the event listener kind of logic in one action, right? And the way of doing it is pretty much, is is, I would say rather straightforward. But it's, which is you would you take the elements and then you call an event listener, and yeah. So th this is actually the same event listeners that we've seen earlier in the uh, previous code, right? It's the same event listeners. Uh, except that previously you use on key down and now you have to manually kind of listen to that event by adding event listeners. And every time when you add event listeners, you also need to re remember to remove it on the destroy method. And now within the key down, you, yeah, I basically copy and paste the same code over here, except that this, I replace it with a callback, right? So this, this event listener adding event listeners thing is being encapsulated within like one action and you can use this action across different uh, elements with different secret and with different callback, right? Um, and I guess I can still have time to go for the last last uh, example, which is, it's just actually, I would say um, one trick that I want to share with you all is that in the previous example, you've seen that I've created like a secret combo action Right, and I call a callback function over here when, when something happens. But actually, I, if, if I want, I don't have to do it this way. 
um, I can actually um, do it like this, where I can listen to a custom events uh, like on secret combo achieve, right? Uh, doing it this way means that um, it's, I don't know, probably it feels more uh, stylistically, it looks nicer, right? Uh, but also it kind of uh, decoupled between the action and the events that you want to do something, right? And to achieve this is pretty, uh, it's, it's that you dispatch and custom events over here. Right, you dispatch a custom event, which the same the name that you want to listen. Right, so let me show you some examples that this may be useful. Is that for example, you want to have a button that you can click three times and then do something like a triple click. Right, you click one, two, three, and then you should see something on the console. Right, uh, instead of having like an on-click listener and you have to implement that counting and then do your do it yourself, what you can do is you can add an action and that action itself will define a new custom event, which is the triple click, right? So uh, so it's, it's like, you can tell people that, oh, I have written an action, you just use it. And then you can start to listen to a new event called a triple click. And the implementation of this triple click action is pretty much the same as what you have done using on click, except that you have to implement the listener yourself. And over here you dispatch once it's you click twice, you dispatch a custom event called a uh, triple click. Right, so yeah, this is, I'm like showing you examples of um, how you could use actions and the uh, examples or the ideas is uh, limitless, right? So the, just a summary again, your ex events, your actions is just a normal function that takes in the elements and probably a param that you can pass in. And yeah, this function will be called when your element is mounted. And if you return an object, it can contain two methods, which is update and destroy. And the update will be called when the params change and destroy is called when that element is removed from the DOM. And that is spelled action in essence. So any questions? Uh, yeah, I take questions if you have any. Oops. Thanks, Lee Hao. That was amazing. I actually understood some smelt. Thank you. Uh, is there a question or chat? I see chat. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I just stuck your slides up. You answered my question. Oh. Uh, already, yeah. Okay. I was wondering if it was possible to pass in options from the element into the action function, mm. uh, but it's uh, passing in parameters, and it takes them at, at the beginning. Yeah, it takes them at the beginning as well as in the update. Mm. Yes, that's great. I had a more uh, have a more general question. Uh -huh. um, I was thinking of trying out some salt, uh, maybe some salt native. Mm -hmm. Why not? Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering if you had any recommendations for ESLint plugins that I should know about, or maybe VS Code plugins that you recommend. Ah, okay. Um, I believe both of them have uh, rather like official kind of plugins, right? So if you look for VS Code, I believe there's a VS Code spell plugin that is okay official uh let me see uh it should be like when i say yeah you you will see that it's it's like the publisher is spelled right right yeah not too not too hidden yeah okay so, i so, see that one and do you use anything special for eslint or you just use you just use this plugin for vs code um, you could use a ESLIN plugin for Svelte as well, which is also within like, like the Svelte uh, okay. organization, right? So I, I believe this will give you like so-called official supports if you are worrying like not up to date and stuff. Okay, that's great. Thank you. And take a look at them. Yep. 
hopefully help catch my typos when I'm typing. Ah, yeah. When I type on click instead of on colon click and things like that. Yeah, so if you use a uh, spell of VS code, it, um, if you add something like, I can't remember, like, okay, so in your script text, you can probably write something like a length equals to TypeScript. Uh, it, it does not support it in this repo, but if in your, in your, in your VS code, if you do it this way, then it will run like the TypeScript language server. Then you will also know more about like types, right? For example, yeah, you know that this refers to like the variables and you are, are you passing in the right function and stuff and probably with things like component props and stuff. Yeah. Basically type checking. Right? Yeah, that's great. I will try that. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else have any questions? Uh, seems like everyone is rather shy. Uh, but I guess I can unshare my screen right now. Oops. Okay. Well, we can uh, we can jump into open mic now, and if anyone wants to talk about anything, they can do. And if you have a question for Li Hao, you can, I'm sure you can find him uh, on Telegram or on Twitter. So, like I said, um, my company is looking for a JavaScript engineer and uh, I'll, I'll put a link into the chat so if anyone is interested in. So the company is like, uh, the setup is full remote, so you could technically do work from anywhere as long as you're happy about it. So you can take a look and uh, just more like JavaScript and C++ engineer. That's it from my side. <laughs> Advertisement too much. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. We have a question for Li Hao or for anyone. How extensively is Svelte used? Um, I'm curious about what, what do you mean by extensively? Like, is it like what are the big companies that are using Svelte or like in what scenarios is Svelte being used or uh, probably I can answer either <laughs> uh, both questions, I guess. Uh, I mean, in terms of companies, uh, I, I don't really keep track of like all the companies is being in use, uh, using Svelte, but I like, I like there, there's this like meet with Svelte or Svelte Society Twitter channel. They always, they, they have like uh, showcases of uh, what other like, projects or companies is using Svelte, right? Um, so on top of my head right now, I can think of is, uh, I know like Apple is using, like in some of their campaign sites, um, uh, I guess someone found that they are hiring like Svelte engineers. That, that's how they found it. Uh, um, I, I guess like Google, I remember like there was like a few demos of them uh, using Svelte, right? So yeah, I mean, I, I don't promote like changing your code base overnight to from React or Angular or whatever to Svelte, right? I mean, yeah, so most likely people would do is probably with new projects they want to try out, then they would try it out. And I guess it's just like slowly picking up uh, popularity and yeah, more people are trying out. That's why more people are, yeah, there are more, more kind of use cases are being showed. What, what I mean use cases would be like probably at first, uh, it's also because of like uh, Spell was like created by uh, Rich Harris, which was which is a um, graphic designer in New York Times. So they do like the interactive uh, news 
right? If you if you visit like news sites like New New York Times or maybe even like Straits Times, you will see some of like interactive uh, charts and stuff, right? So they do they did it. So so at the very first, a lot of examples are those kind of things where a lot of like interactions and uh, visualization stuff. But recently, I also see people doing like games stuff, like a or maybe like a full blown dashboards and stuff. So it's I like in terms of like if you ask me whether technically it's possible, I think like technically it it's kind of not much difference between React and Spelt. You can do basically anything about like so it's like that. There's no like limit on things that you you can't or couldn't do, right? So yeah, so that that's about like how. Extensive Svelte is used. Hope that answers that question. And I see another question. So I guess it's us. Uh, Amos Ang is asking whether Svelte interoperate well with the major frameworks like React. Um, I guess if you really want, you can have um, Svelte application within React and React application within Svelte. Right? The same way of you could have like React within Angular and Angular within React or React within Vue, Vue within React. It is possible, right? You can write a wrapper component and that can be done, right? Whatever is inside is handled by Svelte, whatever is outside is handled by React, right? Uh, that is entirely possible. Like if you're really looking into something like that and you face problems or you don't know how to do it, then probably I can help you if you want, right? But I mean, why are you trying to do that? I'm not really sure. Oh yeah, so um, there, there's also another way of um, so-called micro front ends about like mixing multiple frameworks in one application, which is to use web components. I think some people would like package up like your component in like a web component and whatever inside is, um, uh, whatever inside is like, like web encapsulated within your web component. Um, so question is like React and Vue are libraries while Spec Angular are frameworks, right? Uh, I guess, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know answer this or say like, uh, I, to me, it feels they are like technicalities of like, what is your definition of libraries and frameworks? Uh, if you, if you means that, I mean, if you use React, the library, but you most likely would use other things together within a React ecosystem together with React, right? And Redux and stuff. And uh, it's, it's, it was, uh, okay. Uh, but anyway, you, you could, you could use React, Vue, Svelte, Angular within each other. I believe it's possible. It's just, uh, I, I believe there will be someone trying out and have a demo somewhere. Uh, yeah, as long as you have like a wrapper that nicely translates like one framework's API to another, it, it is entirely possible. It's just that whether, what's the purpose of doing so, right? Yeah. Hope that I'm like not rambling over here. <laughs> I, don't know. I think they, they, they can do some similar things. So uh, uh, you don't need to use one if you have the other because you can you could effectively do it in the one that you have already but there might be a reason you want to use another one if if there's a very nice component published out there that somebody's already done a lot of work on and you want to use that in your app but it's for a different framework mm. yeah but i but i find that most likely someone out there would go out and do the same component library right. using your framework of choice. I believe like using like React and Angular or Vue right now, like popular frameworks out there right now, you run it like it's most likely you, you wouldn't run in a chance of like having one library that does not support, uh, that does not have like a pot or wrapper in your framework. That, that's what I feel. Yeah. Um, for me, I think these um, like micro front end like stuff is not for uh, like small application. It's like usually a big enterprise with uh, several team. So one team it might be very strong on Angular, and when you click into a navigation, it will load the Angular application, 
and this team is always doing angler and then you know another team might do react and it's difficult to find an angler engineer for example someone like me for example so uh, maybe uh, this, this is a reason usually uh, it's just for big company for small I don't see a reason for like putting multiple framework into a single application but for a big enterprise maybe they have reason for, for doing so I'm just going to drop some links which I didn't share earlier on. Make it easier for people to reach. Um, I guess if if. Nothing. I'll, I'll, I'll be going off for my late. Yeah, I guess so. Bye. <laughs> Thanks very much for your talk today. Welcome. Uh, it's very quiet over here, but yeah, I will see you all next meetup, hopefully. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Um, thank you. Yeah, thanks to everyone for coming. Bye. Thank see you. you. Thanks, Al. Bye. Thank you, Chung. Enjoy for hosting today. Yeah, and I thanks think to Alex. Michael too for the our uh, host from Engineers SG. Okay, let's wrap it up then, and um, uh, keep an eye on GitHub and Meetup.com for next month. And if you have a talk, if you have something you want to share, please do drop it on our GitHub issue. Okay, bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Hey, bye, Joey. Have a good night. You too. Bye-bye.